If you want to know more about how the coronavirus is affecting the global economy and your investment portfolio, then you're going to want to watch the rest of this video. I'm your host, Stephen Rochal, along with my co-host, Neil Frankel, and this is The Smart Money Show. Welcome back, and thanks for tuning in to another episode of The Smart Money Show. Today, we're talking about all things coronavirus and the impact that it's having on the global economy. Now, to put things in perspective, last year during the flu season, in the U.S. alone, there were over 35 million cases of the common influenzas. Over 500,000 of those folks were hospitalized, and there were over 34,000 deaths, that's right, from the common flu just right here in the U.S. Worldwide, that number was more like 500,000. That's how many people die worldwide, even today, just from the common flu. Now, it's not surprising that most of those people are older, over the age of 60, and many of these folks also have compromised immune systems. Those are the folks that have the highest mortality rates with the common flu. And so far, this coronavirus isn't much different. Worldwide, there have been over 86,000 cases of COVID-19, as they're calling this coronavirus, and almost half of these cases, they've already made a full recovery. Now, there has been about 2,900 deaths so far, and we just experienced our first death here in the U.S. from COVID-19, but the vast majority of these deaths have been people over the age of 60 and those that already have compromised immune systems. Now, yes, this thing is contagious, and it is spreading to more countries. Just the other day, the governor of California said that we're monitoring about 8,000 people here in the state that may have come into contact with the virus. We, we just don't know yet. Um, but you know what else happened, Neil? Uh, last week, the stock market experienced a technical correction. You know, that means that many U.S. international stocks, their value was at least 10% lower than the highs that it reached. Um, actually, the S&P 500 hit its most recent peak on February 19th. So, Neil, let me ask you, you've been around a bit longer than I have. Have we ever seen anything like this before in the stock market? Well, as someone who's 62 years old, this is something that's near and dear to my heart because um, I'm in the, pop the target population. And, um, but with respect to the, the, the stock market, yeah, we've seen corrections like this before. It's not fun, um, but unfortunately, it's a normal part of investing and to be expected. Now, the coronavirus is... Uh, is is more contagious than the, the normal flu, and it also looks like it's more deadly. Um, it's more fatal, but but we've seen situations in the past with health scares that have impacted the stock market. Uh, in 1981, uh, this was, I think, before you were born. I'm not sure. Yeah, I wasn't here yet. Okay, so we... HIV and AIDS became an issue uh, that we became suddenly aware of. And as soon as we became aware of it, the S&P 500 dropped 18%. Now, year to date in 1981, the market was down 9.7%. In 2003, we had the SARS virus, which is a type of coronavirus, and which, by the way, is far more fatal than the, the coronavirus that we're dealing with now. So as soon as it hit the screen, the S&P dropped uh, 500, excuse me, the S&P 500 dropped 14%. But interestingly, in 2003, the market actually ended up 26%. And what's fascinating to me about that is that that comes on the heels of, you know, in the early 2000s, 2000, 2001, and 2002, the market crashed 50% because of the dot-com bust. But you'd think that as a result of the SARS coming online right on the heels of that, the market would just fall apart, but the market actually ended up. Um, in 2014, Ebola um, tanked the market 8% on the, on the outset. Uh, but for the year 2014, the market was up 11%. Now, what's, what's fascinating is that if you look at historically, over the last 50 years, there have been 13 uh, pandemics, and there just have not been uh, a, a huge long-term impact from the on the stock market after the initial scare. 
But there's been other notable events as well. You might remember in 2011, we had the United States uh, credit worthiness was downgraded and the S&P, as soon as that event happened, the S&P dropped 19%, which is huge. It was wow. scary. And for wow. two weeks, the market dropped almost 20%. But for the year, the market was flat. And more recently in 2018, the last quarter of 2018, US-China trade war heated up. And in that last quarter of 2018, the market dropped again 19%. For the year, the market was down 14%. But like you said earlier, or I think you said earlier, you're going to say later, uh, the market actually for 2019, the year after, did very, very well. That's right. So, I mean, it sounds like this isn't anything new. I mean, that this type of coronavirus, COVID-19, that's new. But we've seen things like this before in the stock market. And and, and here's what the, the S&P 500 looks like so far this year. You know, like we said, it's about 14% off of its high on February 19th. But uh, so far, year to date, this, the S and P five hundred is down about eight and a half percent. You know, not the greatest. Doesn't feel great. But Neil, why do you think the market's behaving this way? Well, primarily because people are scared out of their minds. We don't have all the. We certainly don't have reliable information coming out of China, and we don't have enough data from other countries. So the market and investors hate uncertainty, and that's a huge driver of what we're seeing. As we've seen in the past, that's the common thread through all these crisis events, be that, be that uh, they, uh, health related or, or finance related. But we are seeing some real problems. China has been in lockdown literally for the past couple of months, and they're disrupting, and that's disrupting the global supply chain. A lot of things, uh, products are still manufactured or at least assembled in China. Consumer electronics, apparel, uh, com and components that get, sh that get shipped all across the globe to manufacture other products, those things have been halted or curtailed. So that's going to have impact on a, a, a negative impact on the ability of those companies to make profits because they won't have anything to sell. Uh, and consumption and travel sectors are also taking a huge hit. And not just in China, conferences are being postponed and canceled. The Mobile uh, World Congress in Barcelona was canceled. And there are talks of the Tokyo Olympics possibly being canceled. Uh, and the last time that happened was World War II. So schools are even closing. People just aren't going out much and they're avoiding large crowds. Right. And, you know, we heard from some of our clients. Um, I was on the phone the other day and one of my clients was telling me that he had to cancel his cruise. He was really excited. He was going on this cruise. It was a river cruise in Europe. But I mean, who wants to go on a cruise right now? That's, you know, it's a little bit scary. But, you know, it's not it's not changing everybody's plans. Uh, I was talking to another client and him and his wife just got back from Thailand. They were there for about three weeks. They had a great time. They said, yeah, it was pretty quiet over there and they had quite a bit of uh, private dining. But uh, ultimately, people are still out and about. It's not bringing the whole world to a, to a screeching halt. And that also means not every sector and every stock is dropping either. I mean, there's a lot of companies out there that are actually benefiting, at least to some degree, from the coronavirus, right? You have more people using social media. You have a lot of folks working virtually, hosting virtual meetings. Uh, there's a lot of technologies that help businesses do things like um, electronic signatures. I know we use some of that. Uh, what about streaming movies and TV shows? There's a lot more people at home uh, that are doing those kinds of things. So some of these companies are actually doing all right. Um, but, I mean, what do you think, Neil? We have to probably temper our expectations for growth through the rest of the year. I, or, I mean, what's your opinion on that? Well, it's a really good question. Um, you know, the earnings outlook for the rest of the year, you know, has been reduced. Uh, certainly... The first quarter, there's a broad agreement that the earnings for the S&P and for global uh, large companies is going to be significantly reduced. Now, there's a lot of difference of opinion on what earnings are going to look like thereafter. If someone says to you they know what's going to happen to earnings for the year or for the next three months, six months, nine months, whatever, they're, they're kidding themselves and they're trying to kid you. No one knows. There's broad disagreement on what happens going forward. Keep in mind 
that historically speaking, once the number of new cases starts to level off or decline, um, economic activity starts to heat up. And historically, the, this is no guarantee of the future, but historically the stock market rebounds really quickly. So we're seeing a lot of different emotions in the stock market, and that's a big driver of what's going on, what you've seen the last week. Look, the coronavirus is real, but like I said, we got to put it in perspective. Uh, investing is long-term. It, it's not just a one week or one month or even a one year event. You got to think long-term. Big moves like this can be very scary. It hurts, and it's frightening, and, but we've got to keep the big picture in mind. Don't forget that last year, the S&P was up 28%. And if you look at the market over the past 10 years, from February 2010 to now, the market is way up, even despite all the, the horrible things that looked like they were, they, they, that they were going to tank the market, the economy was going to destruct and, and, and never recover. The economy has always been very resilient. So historically, over the last 20, 30, 40 years, with all the ups and downs, the good and the bad, the S&P 500 has averaged about 9% per year. Yeah, and that's a good point, Neil. I mean, long term, this could yield some opportunities, like diversifying supply chain more across the globe into new areas that we haven't even developed yet in emerging economies. There's also the possibility of interest rates going lower. There's been a lot of talk amongst central bankers that the governments around the world might need to come in and stimulate the economy a little bit. If Since we know that things are bad right now and they're going to get better or we hope they're going to get better, why don't we just go to the sidelines now, sell everything, go to cash, and just buy back in when things are looking better? I mean, I guess if you have a really good crystal ball or fortune teller, uh, let me know who they are, by the way, because uh, mine doesn't work. Um, but seriously, right? I mean, market timing is a fool's game. No one has been able to ever do that successfully over the long term. Uh, a broken clock is right twice a day, so you might get it right here and there. But you've got to put your emotions to the side. Uh, you, you can't take drastic measures in times like this, either buying or selling, right? It doesn't mean you should just buy the dip right now either. If you've had cash on the sidelines for a while, then maybe, yes, this is a better entry point to start investing in the stock market. But you'd probably be better served by dollar cost averaging, this idea of consistently putting in little by little uh, over the long term. But bottom line, I wouldn't suggest piling into stocks right now, nor would I suggest selling everything and going away for a while. Maybe the stock market will go down a little bit more. Nobody really knows. But there's other really important things going on in the world right now. We've got the Democratic primaries, as well as an election year right here in the U.S., uh, it was just announced the other day that the Taliban, along with the U.S., that there's a, a peace deal. So it sounds like U.S. troops are possibly leaving Afghanistan uh, in the near term. And look, over time, the stock market probably will go back up. But keep this in mind. Here at Navaline, your portfolios are diversified. I mean, Neil, you wouldn't want to have all your money invested in China right now, would you? No. Nope. So look, it's impossible to predict a health emergency, especially anything of this magnitude. And diversification alone isn't going to immunize your portfolio from these types of situations. But it does help. And while the past is no guarantee of future results, there have been countless health emergencies just like this in the past. There's been wars, economic trouble, and other things that us humans have brought amongst ourselves. Yet despite all that, the economy survived and expanded and time and time again, we've prevailed. So look, it could be really foolish to make investment decisions based on the outside chance that this coronavirus tanks the whole global economy. Could things get worse? I mean, sure they could. When you think about the fundamentals of the global economy, this is really event-driven what we're seeing right now. That's what we've been talking about. This is not <laughs> fiscal mismanagement. This is not geopolitical tensions. We're not at war. Right, so bottom line, this health event, it's being managed really well, or at least as well as it can be. There's a global response. It's all over the media. Everybody knows about it. There's a worldwide efforts to develop a vaccine, and there's a lot of money, time, and energy being spent managing this situation. And personally, I think that's actually a positive thing to see us all coming together for the common good of humanity. 
So if you have questions about your portfolio or your finances, call us at the office, send us an email, and let's set up a time to meet. Also, if you learned something new in this episode of The Smart Money Show, share it with your friends, share it with your family members, because they probably have the same questions and concerns that you do. Until next time, I'm Stephen Rishal. And I'm Neil Frankel. And we're helping you... Get smart with your money.